I recently described a case featuring a 17-year-old boy in the St. Louis area who is afflicted with a brown recluse spider bite. Link to that video is in the description below. Despite best efforts by the parents, the boy lived a lifestyle that perhaps allowed and encouraged arachnids, among other things, to thrive. He lived on the first floor of a house in a region where Loxosceles reclusa is endemic. He would throw his clothes on the floor in a pile, mixing clean and soiled clothes for weeks on end. What was shown in video was likely cleaner still than the reality. He had a temporary wake-up call when one day he woke up and found a spider crawling around in his bed. But old habits die hard, and he promptly reverted back to his ways, and unluckily, he one day put on a sock that had a spider in it. It bit him, and he didn't know it at first. He mistook it for a rock in his sock, then it bit him again. He ignored it for a while until he found a blistering, bruise-like lesion that he thought looked strange. Usually, a stone in your sock won't mess up your foot like that. He went to look back in the sock and found the smashed spider body inside. But he didn't come into the emergency room until he noticed that his urine was red. That video, and this one too, are not here to scare anyone about spiders. It's to teach about the medicine of one particular genus of venomous spider using a medical case. Its outcomes are not even as catastrophic as some others described in writing. When I lived in Chicago, I lived in a high rise and found out the hard way that for some reason, the spiders kept getting bigger the higher up you lived. Usually they were outside and you can see them from the windows. Somehow grasshoppers were able to get above the 40th floor. I don't know how they did that, but the big spiders would catch them and eat them. Occasionally, the spiders would somehow get on the inside of the window and into your unit. When this happened to me, I would usually see a newly spun web at the top corner of my window when the sun was shining in in the morning. The scary part was that there was no spider to be found by the web. Where was it? Was it hiding in my bed? Was it in my kitchen, ready to take a bite out of my breakfast? At night, when I got home, I would find the spider after seeing the reflection of the ceiling light in the window. There was no sleeping on those nights. And by big, I mean that those spiders were probably around the size of my palm. Now with that said, whatever species of spider that was, it is not venomous in a way that a bite could cause systemic illness because the United States has two known venomous spiders endemic to the land. That's it. You might find on websites that there are others, but the best evidence that we have at this time of recording in June 2022, there's Loxosceles and Latrodectus, the recluse spiders and the black widow. And those big high-rise Chicago spiders are neither of those, especially not a brown recluse, because brown recluse doesn't live in Chicago. Loxosceles spiders live in this region, central to south Midwest and along the US-Mexico border to Southern California. If you live north of I-80, and remember even number interstates go east-west, so this one goes from San Francisco to New Jersey, you should not find brown recluses. That statement opens a can of worms. That statement is the reason why I had to delay the video on the Chubby Emu channel so that this one could be released at the same time. It's not going to just be the comments to this video and the Chubby Emu video that will comment about where brown recluse spiders are, but those same comments are in actual correspondence in medical literature. More on this in a bit. There's not just a brown recluse, but there's also a desert recluse spider, Loxosceles deserta, that's all along the US-Mexico border. Loxosceles spiders have three pairs of eyes arranged in a non-touching pattern, and the brown recluse often has a fiddle shape on its back. The spider's brown body can be up to half an inch, almost two inches if you include the leg span. And this is important to know because sometimes a diagnosis of brown recluse spider bite is made in an area where these spiders don't live. And they did recover the body of some spider, and they'll claim that it's a brown recluse when it's not. Lots of recluse spiders may not be big enough to be venomous. Females appear to produce more venom than males. Female venom appears to cause more intense cutaneous and systemic signs and symptoms. Among the spiders in Loxosceles genus, the bites appear to produce signs and symptoms similar but varying in severity. Therefore, the pathological condition arising from a bite is called Loxosceleism. This also means that if we look globally, there are different species in the Loxosceles genus reported on every continent except Asia so far. South America appears to have the most reported cases of Loxosceleism. Brazil has the gaucho spider, which is Loxosceles gaucho. The reports published from these countries of Loxosceles envenomation are similar to what we see in the United States for brown and desert recluse, if the presentations aren't greater in severity over there. So what does a bite look like? Well, I said in the chubby emu video there's a cutaneous Loxosceleism, sometimes characterized by the red, white, and blue appearance at first. That's erythema, ischemia, and necrosis. 
The venom is a mixture of toxins consisting of proteins, glycoproteins, and low molecular weight peptides. There's also enzymes, collagenases, alkaline phosphatases, phosphohydrolases, hyaluronidases, and metalloproteinases. Sphingomyelinases D are the enzymes that seem to be the key from the venom in humans. They catalyze the hydrolysis of sphingomyelin, which releases choline and ceramide 1-phosphate. They hydrolyze a wide range of phosphides, causing cellular necrosis. On the skin, there's a gravitational spreading pattern that's observed, likely from hyaluronidase. As cells necrose, indirect activation of the complement system System recruits polymorphonuclear leukocytes. In red blood cells, sphingomyelinase D induces activation of membrane brown metalloproteinases. Glycophorins are cleaved, activating complement by the alternative pathway ending in cell lysis. If there's an alternative pathway, there's also a classical complement pathway and sphingomyelinase D activates that in erythrocytes, changes conformation in the membrane, leading to exposure of phosphatidylserine on the external lipid monolayer, allows for C1Q binding, the first part of the classical complement pathway, ending in hemolysis. Hemolysis leads to free hemoglobin, causing oxidative damage because of the iron moiety, depositing pigment in the nephrons and leading to kidney damage. The hemolytic anemia is suggested by a low hemoglobin, low haptoglobin, because that's what the body tries to use to protect against free hemoglobin, and lactate dehydrogenase. So, in the systemic case of loxosalism, which is rare, these patients can become really sick. And the cutaneous manifestations of loxosalism don't appear to have any correlation to the severity of systemic illness. In the United States, we don't have anything more than supportive care for loxosalism. For wounds, there can be debridement if needed, but there's no anti-venoms in the United States available for systemic toxicity. The venom is temperature sensitive, so cold compress and elevate the bite if you know for sure it's loxosceles, and then see your physician. So how rare exactly is all of this? The short answer is, based on the data that we have, systemic illness is very rare. At least for brown recluse, it's in the name recluse. In general, we know that spiders are synanthropic, meaning that the more people there are, the more spiders there are. They happen to live among us, but it's not like they want to cuddle up with us at nighttime. There's people who have practiced emergency medicine who are the doctors who would have seen most of these cases for more than 25 years in Memphis, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Kansas, Northern Texas, where the spider's endemic, and they haven't ever seen really severe cases throughout their career. If your first reaction is, oh, but that's anecdotal, I don't disagree with you, but don't forget the effects of the events of 2020. In light of the many worlds that I've been a part of in my past lives, this quote perfectly describes what I'm about to show you. You want science and studies? F you. I've got scars and blood and vomit. At least 20 years ago, doctors and entomologists put in writing in medical literature that brown recluse spider bites in the United States are overdiagnosed. There's hundreds of cases being reported in California, and yeah, lots of people in that state, and Loxosceles could be there, but reported from San Francisco? Didn't we say that I-80 is in San Francisco? And if you live I-80 and north, brown recluse doesn't live there, so they're not endemic there. Where did that bite come from? A staphylococcus infection causes necrotic skin wounds, so does strep, so does Lyme disease, so does fungus and poison ivy and vasculitis and many others. So are we sure it was a brown recluse? spider bite? There's recent case reports published in literature in 2021 saying that in Michigan, due to the shift in climate, that brown recluse is there now. And then someone might say, well, maybe it wasn't a spider bite. What's a response you might get to that statement? You want science and studies? F you. I've got scars and blood and vomit. So we have our inputs of information here, non-endemic area of spider for bites that appear to be overdiagnosed. Patient had significant risk factors for other dermonecrotic wounds. No spider was recovered and based on the patient claim that an insect bit her leg while she was sleeping outside. I'll let you do more digging if you would like. There's correspondence from 2005 in the New England Journal talking about brown recluse spider bites. Physicians based out of Connecticut, north of I-80, saying that they've seen some brown recluse spider bites over the last several decades of practice, and they were told in writing those were not brown recluse bites. Okay, so in professional correspondence, this is only a small handful of what's out there. The main point is that if the spiders don't live in the area, the dermonecrotic wound that you're seeing is likely not cutaneous loxosalism, and you want to rule out other causes before landing on just spider bite, arachnidism, because you could be wasting precious time on treatment. This is the extreme case of everything that looks like it is a brown recluse spider bite. 
Now swing the pendulum to the other extreme, that nothing is ever a brown recluse spider bite. Well, that's also appeared in documentation, where a patient was thought to have a soft tissue infection, community-acquired methicillin-resistant staph aureus, even had exploratory surgery, but instead it turned out to be systemic loxosilism, and the patient had a surgery that they didn't need to have, and this happened in a place where brown recluse are endemic to the area. None of this is dunking on my colleagues. This action and reaction sequence isn't unique. Patients do the arguing about spider bites too. It's going to be prominent anywhere where people can comment, especially given the frightening nature of spiders. So the main point of this and the chubby emu video is that there's two known venomous spiders in the United States, the brown recluse and the black widow. Their bites can cause systemic illness, although they're rare in both cases. The recluse spiders live here. Black Widow lives all across the lower 48 states. If you don't live in this area of the country, more likely than not, it's not a brown recluse bite, if it's even a spider bite in the first place. If you don't leave your clothes all over the floor like the patient in the chubby emu video did, that may help prevent you putting on clothes that has a spider hiding in it.